how do we have these dialogues? What are some of the guidelines? How can we teach people how to talk about these things mm -hmm. and not end up polarized? It starts right here, deep in your heart. Tom Rutledge and Dr. Alan Berger bring over 90 years of clinical experience to this important podcast, and they offer you a guarantee. You will gain something of personal value from each episode. And now, what matters most. It starts right here. Welcome back to Start Right Here. I'm Tom Rutledge, and with me is my uh, co-host and wonderful friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Alan Berger. And today we have with us, uh, we're, we're um, I think this is the first time we've brought back a guest because uh, it's like an encore, uh, you know. Well, first uh, guest that was willing to come back after being on the show with us is with the real Well, yeah, I wasn't going to mention how many we had asked to come back, but it's like... <laughs> It's the first one that, that we, we'll, we'll get into that later. But uh, is, you guys didn't abuse me too badly last you, time. You, and what we were thinking that your resilience is just great, John. Is what it is. Is that you just have amazing resilience. John, John, John left us pummeled in the street after that last time. We're, we're, none of us are a match for John's wit. It's like, but his, 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 this is John Amadeo, Doctor John Amadeo, the, the author of of uh, many wonderful books and articles. Uh, one love of which betrayal. we're going to love and betrayal is one I'm still using yeah. and dancing with fire is dancing is with fire most, is the most thing. recent, yeah. which is outstanding. Yeah. and dancing with fire, John, that, that's the one that has the excerpt in it that we had been talking about recently that someone had sent you and, and talked to you about it being so prophetic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, let's start there. Can, well, can, can, it's not very long. Could you read it? Oh my God. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> okay. You should read it. Do you have it? Uh, no. All right. <laughs> I, All right. I do, well, but I do. I don't have it right here in front of me. All right. I'll read it. Um, okay. You can interrupt me, though, if I get so it's anymore. Okay. okay. No, it, it, I, just, I just think it is so on point. That's a, it's a great launching off place from our because last last week and, and we had heard from some people who said they really appreciated this last week talking about the the attack on the Capitol and um, and and what we do, which is to, to consider and think about how to respond to such things, both inside ourselves and, and in, the, in our world. So uh, uh, when we got your when I got that email from you, I thought that was perfect. Yeah, thanks. I had forgotten I wrote this passage, so someone sent me a nice email reminding yeah. me about it. This is from my 2014 book, Dancing with Fire, and mm -hmm. some really nice person thought it was a prophetic section from my book. It so is. it's talking about when we cling to being right is one of the causes of sufferings. Buddhism often talks about what are the causes of our suffering and anguish, and clinging is, in Buddha's third noble truth, clinging and craving are the causes of our suffering. So this follows up on that section in the book. Quote from, this from the book, clinging to being right can become a delicious addiction because it activates the pleasure centers of the brain. If we have a low tolerance for uncertainty, we will neatly order our world by putting people in fixed categories. People are good or bad. They're either with us or against us. They're saved or infidels. Clinging to these self-comforting beliefs creates intolerance, which on a larger scale ultimately undermines democracy. I'll read that again. Clinging to these self-comforting beliefs creates intolerance, which on a larger scale ultimately undermines democracy. And, you, know, you can interrupt if you want, if you want to comment. I, I, I I'm, we're we're oh, going to talk about it. We're, yeah. we're going to talk about intolerance. That's, a, that's such a big thing. Intolerance. Okay, yeah. good. We may favor politicians who prey upon our fears, exploit our discontents, and rely on our ignorance and gullibility. Unfortunately, these are often the very politicians whose message gets splashed across the airwaves by an industry that thrives on controversy. 
With their difficulty tolerating ambiguity, they take hardened positions on complicated issues and speak with a conviction that activates our angst, our anxiety, and preys on our psychological vulnerabilities, such as for acceptance and belonging. Now, we don't want to feel accepted, right? We want to feel like we belong. So I think that's another key here. That's, that, that, that is a big one. And, and the difficulty with, uh, with, that's one of the things I've dealt with uh, and thought about a lot is the difficulty with ambiguity, the difficulty with uncertainty, that, you mm-hmm. know, the nature of life is uncertain. And we have as human beings or as, as Western human beings, or maybe just as American human beings, we have so little tolerance for uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like, and, you know, so let's definitely talk about that. Right. Yeah. And we want to feel like we're valued, that we're important. And if we belong to a group that agrees with us, validates us, that's very compelling. I disagree. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, John feels bad about himself now. (laughs) Really? Now you're shaming me. My God. There's so much truth in it, in what you said. It's really a very scary, a frightening reality. Right. You can yeah. we're seeing that played out. I mean, that's that's we are witnessing exactly what you wrote about at this particular point um, in history. Yes, I well, think and, psychology of cults is it make, gives us a sense of belonging and connection to join a group that believes in the same thing. And right. Anyway, and I'll, I'll continue. I'll continue. Okay. Yeah. Tom, do you want to say something? No, no, I didn't know. I was going to say, uh, I want you to yeah, keep reading. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Taking this concept to an extreme, we might observe such tactics in Hitler's horrifying rise to power. He seemed amused, he seemed to be amused by it all when he famously exclaimed, what luck for rulers that men do not think. And Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda, is credited with popularizing this familiar political maneuver, quote, make the lie big, make it simple, keep saying it, and eventually they will believe it. Wow. Yes. That's a scary one, huh? I, amen. I, I, yes. And wow. it's, it's, and, it, and it's not new. I think that's important for us to say all of this stuff is, you know, this is one the, uh, the, the thing I sent out after our, our last uh, uh, podcast kind of summarizing, at least my position, I think, I think mine and Patrick's and Alan's always, uh, we must no longer leave our government unsupervised. And, uh, and I think what's happened here is this stuff has been going on for a long time and, and we have left it unsupervised. We, we, we have not paid as much attention as we need to. And I was just like alcoholism itself. It only gets worse. Mm-hmm, so it's exactly. a progressive illness. Mm-hmm, right. Can I just, um, uh, I have a quote here from uh, Mitt Romney um, in the aftermath of the uh, Capitol insurrection Uh, the best way we can show respect for the voters who are upset is by telling them the truth that is the burden and the duty of leadership the truth is that president-elect biden won this election president trump lost scores of courts the the president's own attorney general and state election officials both republican and democrat have reached this unequivocal decision so uh, i'm not a big mitt romney fan but i think you know the idea that you know the truth (laughs) will set you free and that mm-hmm. the way that you respect, you know, the super superstition of, uh, you know, this block of people that, uh, you know, are clinging to some of the things that, you know, John just outlined, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Worth noting. So that's just one yeah. thing. Well, that's yeah. A that's a good one, Patrick. Thanks for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is a challenge, John, isn't it? Cause we were talking last time about the effort it takes for someone who is rescued from a cult Mm -hmm. and to deprogram them and Mm -hmm. get them to see what the reality really is like, right. Is to pierce that veil Mm -hmm. that, you know, like what, who was it? Was it the quote that you read? That was from, um, about tell them a big lie and uh, g- g- that's contributed to, to Goebbels, Goebbels propaganda that's minister. That's right. And I mean, mm-hmm. look, that's what happens. I mean, and then on the other side is the, is the susceptibility, the vulnerability to such a lie. And see, that's the other part of this is when people feel disempowered and they get somebody coming in and saying, we're going to now, you know, empower you. We're going to give you the voice you never had. You know, we're going to make America what you want America to be. 
that's that's a powerful elixir. I mm -hmm. mean, when you, when you it's coupled with the lie. Mm -hmm. I mean, that becomes the problem. And we were talking about that last time. Is that I think you know there are certain experiences we have in our life that make us more vulnerable than not at times to these kinds of lies that are perpetuated by people that are offering, you know, what do you hear from a cult leader? I am going to take you into a special place hmm. and right. I'm going to let you see, you're going to be a part of an elite group of people, right? Mm -hmm. you, are, you are the chosen ones. I mean, mm -hmm. so there's this whole thing about, wow, finally, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get my due, so to speak, right? I'm, somebody's going to recognize my worth. Somebody's going to pay attention to my needs and promote my needs. Right. Powerful stuff, man. Just very powerful. And you're being told you're very special because you're seeing these things that other people are not seeing. You're part of a there special group. That's right. So it gets reinforced and it creates that vicious cycle that goes on. I mean, at the time, you know, I, I'm not a that great of a historian, but I know that Germany was in a heck of a place when Hitler came into being in terms of the economic crises. And, right. you know, just had, you know, had, had lost World War I, which was a great embarrassment for them. And mm -hmm. this, the concessions that had to be made and the hands that had to be tied and the humiliation. And now here comes someone that says how great the German people are and we're going to make Germany great again. I mean, it would, there was such, you know, the, the, the environment, what was going on at the time was such a, a, an amazing host for that kind of a message. Right. Yeah, so much shame, so much humiliation from the terms of the peace treaty for World War I just fomented a lot of shame. And, which, and shame, as we know, often gives rise to rage and violence. Right. So you look at a group of Americans who maybe lost their jobs or they're, they're trying to get ahead in America and they see immigrants maybe taking their jobs and being afraid immigrants are going to take their jobs. And they feel well, they're being they're being told that. I mean, see, see, right. that's that's one of the things that, yeah. that I'm thinking is, and Alan, Alan, as you're describing what you're describing, you're you're filling in content, which is which makes perfect sense that people, oh, this is my rightful place, da da da. da. But the idea, and I'm not saying that some of that's not there, but I think the thing that we're talking about though is it, it the reason is it's nearly feels nearly impossible to to have a conversation with somebody who's far into this stuff is because it, their position is not content driven it's like it's it's emotional and what john's you know what we're talking about here is is how people respond because of where they are emotionally right it's it's mm -hmm. you know i mean this may be a stretch but it, but it, it's you know, what I know about myself as somebody who has a, I call it a glitchy brain. I have, I, I, I take medication because my brain doesn't work right without, without medication. I have depression and it's like, and that's depression. Depression shows up in form a lot of times of, of anxiety and fear. And um, one of the things I, I will explain to my clients sometimes is that, that, what, what happens is we're designed so that if something scary in the world happens, I feel afraid. And that's nor normal, natural fear. It's like what happens when your brain, when my, when my brain, I'll use myself as the example, is, is shooting off the, the messages that I'm afraid is my mind in an effort to make myself feel more, more uh, sane will interpret the world as scary. And so when somebody comes, when people are feeling, when they're unsettled, when they're, when they, when they are afraid, when they're, when they are uh, uh, anxious because of uncertainty and somebody comes in and starts filling in the, the content and telling them a story about what's happening to them. Immigrants are coming in. They're going to come to your house and attack you. They're, they're, they're also taking your job. Right. Um, you know, by the, by the way, the, the, the Democrats want to, you know, want to take away your guns. You know, they're just making up, you know, they make up stories, but they match the feeling. The, the feeling is fear. So the, so you go, so that's why, like, if I don't take my medication for three weeks, I, the world doesn't change at all, but the, but the world is a scarier, darker place for me. And I, and I am more vulnerable to believing, you know, things, things that are scary. Yeah. Yeah. Those um, things that this is where content is important because content creates a context. 
Yes. You know, I think that that's what we have to understand that content does create a context. So like you're saying, when they come in in a context, say is that the Democrats want to take your guns. There's a context now that they've mm -hmm. created with this content. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're afraid, like you say, you're going to grab onto that, not question mm -hmm. the content, right? right? You're right, going to right, go with right. context because mm -hmm. the context is where the meaning is given, right? The context mm -hmm. I put something in is where I get meaning from, from the situation or where, where it's how I give meaning to the situation is the context that it's, that it's in. So it's, it's very true. I mean, and you know, uh, it, it's such a challenge because when a person's in that place to find that safety, like you're saying, Tom, is mm -hmm. so great. And when somebody's coming along saying, if you follow me, I will take you to the promised land. Right. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's powerful, man. It's so powerful. Yeah, people want to believe in like a father figure, an authoritarian person who fits the role of your projected father image, and he's going to protect right. you and take care of you. Yeah, well, I was well, thinking too. Th uh, thus religion, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Or some religions. Yeah. yeah. I was listening to Chris Hayes and ta Coates talk about, um, you know, uh, this outcome, kind of like the seeds of this outcome were planted, obviously, like uh, maybe even like hundreds of years ago. But if you want to look at recent history, birtherism, you know, um, if uh, there's a whole, all the people that were there at the Capitol, um, they didn't just think that this election was illegitimate. They thought that, you know, the two terms of Barack Obama was illegitimate. And, um, and that, you know, the Democrats, again, tried to steal, you know, the election in 2016. And, you know, if you just look at that timeline, uh, this is kind of the, uh, you know, it's really hard to see any other outcome, you know, uh, if, that, if this is kind of like the, uh, the soup that people have been, you know, swimming in for the last <laughs> chunk of time. Simmer, simmering, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how you can just tell these lies to people. Like, like Obama's a Muslim, he wasn't born in the USA, and you keep repeating it and saying it over and over again, you make the lie simple. Yep. And eventually people say, well, that, and if he keeps saying it, he can't be that crazy. The person can't be that crazy. He must, there must be truth to this. And they start believing it. Yeah. And if you say, no, so, I won okay. the election, I won the election by a landslide. I mean, who would say that if, it's, if there's not some truth to it? I mean, some, you know, people were thinking, no, well, that must be true then. Maybe I'll, he keeps saying it, it must be true. And of so course, one, of so course one, it's not. Right. But what, what, one of the, uh, uh, yeah, so, so one, there's so many different, different ways we can go with this. But one of the things about that is that so part of the result of all of this or where, or the, where we are so far is I, I, that I hear from people and I feel, I'll, I'll put myself out there as an example, which is just a tremendous disappointment in mankind. You know, in human beings, you know, I'm going like, you know, because you go like, how do, how do you, how do you not think? I mean, I, I mean, I, I get, I become speechless about that. I become, you know, and as you all know, that's, that's kind of rare for me to be speechless, but, but um, it's, I mean, it's, it's really discouraging. Hmm. Yeah. Discouraging, disheartening. Hmm. But, you know, like when you said it is, it says something. I mean, you know, we were all shocked in terms of what happened in World War II, in terms of with the Nazis and the, and the death camps and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, they kept coming back to this big question, which is, well, how could, you know, men and women follow such heinous orders from Hitler and his henchmen, mm -hmm. right? In terms of these death camps and marching. Mm -hmm millions of Jews to their death and, and others, right? And so then Stanley Milgram did that very interesting study. Um, out, I think he was in Harvard when he did it. And the study was, he put an ad in the paper and says, I'm, I'm looking for people to, to participate in an educational study. Um, you will either be the teacher or the student and it's to um, research different ways of, of learning. <laughs> and so you'll be paid like $10 plus given 25% for the car fare to come to the place. Mm -hmm. And so people would show up and they would come in and thinking that they're partic gonna participate in a study and that there's a chance they're gonna be either the student or the teacher. And it was rigged so that they were always the teacher. 
And um, so they would come in and they would be set down at this panel and they were told that this was a study that was going to show the effectiveness of providing a shock uh, to shock someone when they were wrong, right? In terms of learning and the effectiveness of learning. So they did various different you know, variations on this. They changed uh, whether the, 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 the researcher showed up in a lab coat or not, was called doctor or not. I mean, they manipulated all these variables to find out the influence of authority. But it was mind blowing how many people would sit there and shock someone across the way from them. Some, the first study was done, somebody was behind a window, right? On the other side of a window. And then there was a microphone in the other thing. And, 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 and the person, the, the supposed educator was given a mild shock so they could see that this thing was actually shocking the person. And so then there was these, these gradations on this meter that you would turn up. Well, like over 60% of the subjects turned it up into the red area where the person on the other side said, please don't shock me anymore. They're <laughs> screaming at the top of their heads. <laughs> and, and they would turn up and look at the, at the researcher, right? And they'd say, well, what do I do? What do I do? You must continue to give the shock. It's important for us to take the study all the way to the end. And they would come back and shock them. I mean, it was amazing what people would do in terms of, and this is the other part, reason I'm bringing this up. There is a deference to authority that occurs too, in terms of taking responsibility. Is that if I follow somebody else, you hear this now with some of the rioters or the insurrectionists, I really like to call them, that are at the Capitol, they say, well, he told us to do it. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? You see that when they're being talked about it, the president told us to do this. This is what he said that we were supposed to do. Just following orders. I'm just following orders. Right. And see, that's the other component of that. So you take the first thing, our vulnerability to a message that's going to tell us that this is going to be our saving grace, right? This is going to lead us to the promised land. And then this other dynamic of our deference to authority, man, you've got you've got an explosive ingredients put together there. I mean, explosive ingredients. Volatile combination. A volatile, you got a volatile combination of ingredients that you've just mixed together and they, they've been mixed together. They're still mixed together at this point. That's why we're going into this week with the concern we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So, okay. Uh, what's that concern though, that it'll happen again or what, what concern are you- Well, the concern is that there's already been chatter going on that there's going to be armed protests at every capital in the United States, <laughs> you know, objecting to Biden being, an, you know, inaugurated as an ex-president, protesting the, that the vote has been stolen from Donald Trump. And there, there's fear that there's going to be some, I mean, acting out. I mean, when you start to see what was uncovered that people had in Washington, D.C., right, on January mm -hmm. 6th, mm -hmm. I mean, one guy in his truck, he had a 12 Molotov cocktails. He had an AR-15, you know, a lot of ammunition, shotguns. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a scary, scary proposition. Right. Well, this, okay, this, this may be a stretch here. And, and, and I'm, I, I'm truly willing to just, if you guys just say we're, we're, we're not there yet in our conversation, we go, but. I, what I'm coming back to is, is kind of picking up on where we were last last week when we were talking about this. Alan is the, the, the idea of okay, it's you know our it's it's listening to Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris tell us that you know we're supposed to just they want us to think in terms and move toward healing. Okay, now I've, I've got I've gotten my head straight around the idea that you know, you don't, you know, that that's not, that's not the opposite of justice, that, that, that uh, find people being held accountable and, and, and delivering justice is part of healing. Yeah. You know, I heard somebody say one time they, they, to help me understand that they just said, well, you know, nobody, nobody's going to say, you know, yes, this, this man, you know, murdered your family, but we're going to let him go so that you can get on with healing. You know, that's not going to work. So we, I got that part, but, what I, I keep coming back to what we, what we do in our work is we, we work on communication. How, how do we even begin to have conversations with, with people that are we don't agree with? 
That's what I hear people asking me more and more and have all the way around. How do we begin that? Uh, because we, because if it's just another debate, we're gonna, it's never, never going to work. We have to, we need to find ways to, to suggest and deliver some kind of better communication for people. Right? Yeah. It's a big challenge, but it's a worthy direction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I recently heard Jack Cornfield, a popular mm -hmm. meditation. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Talking about this psychologist and, mm -hmm. He said, one thing that might help to realize is that people care about things in different ways. Yes. Like maybe we, we all care about something. Maybe we can help support, you know, people are caring about something. They're caring about their own well-being. They're caring about the country. They're caring about that's, it in a much different way than we're caring about it, but they're, they're caring. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's a common denominator, though, I think, John, of, of other people I've, I've talked to that have said that seems to come up is like, listen for value systems. The idea is, uh, you know, and it makes and see, that's what it helps. I, I sort of get grounded when I come back to the therapy room and think, OK, how do we work with that in therapy in, in much smaller you know, areas. I mean, you know, hopefully we're not, you know, our, our, our couples we're working with are not bombing each other. It's, uh, but the, the idea is under, basically understanding these people care about something. It's, mm -hmm. and, and it's not, they're not expressing it. They're not, you know, they don't interpret it the way they do, but they, but there is a common ground. You know, mm -hmm. they, they're, it's, they care about their families. They care mm -hmm. about, you know, they care about freedom. You know, you know, you know we're, we can be the exact opposite. I think your guy is taking freedom away. Oh, yeah. Well, I think your guy is. But it's like we all care about freedom. So it, so somewhere in there, that's part of it is listening for the values and talking about that. Mm -hmm. But and, and I mean, this is truly a place where I have only the questions at this point. Well, I have some some thoughts about how to do that once you can get started. But getting started, it seems to be the hardest thing. Well, I think the quality of the leadership can, uh, you know, dictate to some extent, you know, the direct, the shape that society takes. And I think there's an opportunity in the early days of this administration to affirm that, like, you know, the, the government is responsive to the needs of people, uh, because a lot of a lot of people have been through almost a year of the pandemic without much in the way of relief or, you know, uh, you know, just compassionate response to kind of like the, you know, uh, sea change we're all going through. And um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, if, uh, you know, if they go, if the Democrats can go bold and if they can, you know, deliver for people across the spectrum, even those that uh, didn't vote for this particular president, mm -hmm. um, I think that maybe uh, there, there might be some space created for, um, uh, for the healing and the conversations and all the, things that, you know, we hope to get to eventually uh, after we've passed this moment. You know? um, I wanted to ask John about um, this part in his article uh, where he talks about attachment wounds. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain a little bit about that in the context of uh, what you were talking about earlier? Well, you know, we all grew up with, it, with attachment wounds where we're not feeling, you know, if we don't feel safely connected with our caregivers, our parents, we have a a vulnerability that we're not, we're not feeling safe. We're not feeling connected. So we might want to glom onto a cling to some sense of safety and belonging through joining a group that believes in what a lot of these insurrection people believe. And, um, you know, Mary Trump's written about this in terms of her uncle Donald's who grew up with a lot of abuse and a lot of shaming. And when we're shamed a lot, we lose contact with our feelings. We lose contact with our vulnerability. We lose contact with our humanity. We just become hardened. We become armored. We lose connection with our heart. We lose empathy for other people's feelings, what other people need. And it's easy to hurt people and harm them, destroy them, if we then paint them with the face of the enemy, that this is the enemy. You know, we because we, we lose empathy for other people. We feel justified in destroying other people when we have this armoring that, that we that we that's been superimposed upon our vulnerable heart. Yeah. Yeah. So if you combine that to what, what Alan's talking about with this, with our tendency to go with authority and shock people, it's mm. like people are, I mean, seriously, people are, are very, sometimes very vulnerable to that. That's right. Well, and too, what, what you're saying too, John, is that, you know, when you feel that shame and you're powerless as a child, one solution to that is to try to take power over. 
Mm. You know, they used to call it identification with the aggressor, right? I mean, that was an old psychoanalytic term Mm -hmm. that we heard a lot is that the, the person that was abused, sometimes they grow up and end up doing the same thing to others that was done to them. And the whole thing was, well, wow, why, how would, how come that wouldn't engender more empathy? Where, my God, I would never want it. Now, some kids go that way, right? Mm-hmm. Some kids, as they grow up, they say, I, not want it. I never want anyone to feel what I felt as a kid. Others go down that other way where they want power over, right? And so mm-hmm. now it becomes a thing of, I'm going to have power. I've cut off my feelings, so I'm not going to be in touch with what this is going to do to anybody else. Nobody cared about my feelings. I'm not going to care about anybody else's. So it's amazing how these wounds manifest themselves like that. But they yeah, it comes, comes an overcompensation for that. Yeah, sense. Comes, yeah, for a sense of inadequacy. And, yeah. and you could see that with him because it, you know, and he's so fixed. We know how insecure that is because he can't mm-hmm. say I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a man in four years has never owned a mistake. And it's not only he doesn't own a mistake, I'm the best there ever has been. My presidency has been incredible. Nobody's ever done what I've done. Nobody's ever won an election like I've won. An Nobody ever had the kind of crowds at the inauguration that I've had. No one ever is. No one's ever had a better response to the coronavirus than I've had. I, I mean, it's 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 she's, you know, and we see that fixed position you talk about is so true. We should be very reluctant to elect anyone who has difficulty saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I made a mistake. Yes. We need true leaders have a certain vulnerability. They realize they're not invincible. They're not emperors. They're not gods. They have humility. That needs to seem like it should be the first criterion of someone to run for office is that they need to, we have to have a, a test on humility and they have to have a certain, they have to have a certain score before they can run. They have, they have enough strength to afford being humble. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's it's a, well, it's, strength. Yeah, it's, what, not, it's a strength. It's not a we, weakness. Right. We need to, you know, one of the, one of, one of the things I've, I've said and written about for a long time is that we, we tend to, we tend to elect, uh, ideologues to to office but ideologues in politics should play a position of commentator it's like they're we, we should I, you know i feel more like i'm a commentator it's like I, I i should be out here stirring stuff up with with thoughts and opinions it's like we should what we should be doing is electing problem solvers people with a record of of, of compromise and, and humility like you're saying and and, and that, that it's like instead we actually have gone because of this really this either or thing that what I'm hearing when, when, when John, you and Alan were talking just then, I'm going, wow, this comes back one more time to a place where we where psychologically we get stuck in some kind of either or dilemma. You know, am I going to be, am I going to be the, am I going to be the champion for the, for the vulnerable or am I going to be the abuser? Like, you know, if I was abused, it's, it's like, am I going to be who I was or am I going to be who that abuser was where we needed an entire, we, we I mean, we have to have an entire paradigm shift here because we, the answer is not in this way of doing it. No, no, yeah. no, it's not. I mean, I, I, I was, uh, I think I've mentioned this before that, that the American psychological association publishes books that they think are, are worthy of publication. And mm-hmm. the, one of the books that was published just recently was a book called beyond your bubble. Hmm. beyond your bubble i like the title and, already and, and and the 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 so it's beyond your bubble um colon how to connect across political divide skills and strategies for conversations that work wow beautiful so that's the title of this book and they really wanted it to come out now because they want to see what they can do you know mm-hmm. on, from the from the american psychological public policy position Mm -hmm. how can we you know contribute to a healthier dialogue so let me just go through a few of these because it's along the lines of what you were suggesting tom Mm -hmm. how do we have these dialogues what are some of the guidelines how can we teach people how to talk about these things Mm -hmm. and not end up polarized right and not end up polarized so one chapter on this whole thing is preparation for dialogue 
Okay. Is putting yourself in the right mind space, right? Is is becoming mindful that if I'm going to go into this dialogue and talk about differences, I don't want to talk about them in a way that's polarizing, mm -hmm. right? And so what that comes down to is how do I manage my own anxiety or reactions to what's being talked about? So first of all, it becomes aware of our own buttons, right? What are the buttons that get pushed on this stuff for me, right? right. Did I have an abusive father? And does Trump remind me of that abusive father? Did I grow up with a narcissist in my life? Does he push that button? Did Was I looking? I didn't have a father. And now here's someone that's coming along and saying, I'll take care of you and just believe in me and I will lead you to the promised land. I mean, so a big part of the preparation for dialogue is this self-awareness. Well, you, what it also is, uh, Alan, what you're saying is it's emotional sobriety to, to come come home to where, you know, we're kind of where we live. Emotional sobriety under extreme circumstances. It's like, how do you, because you know, you're still, because what you just described is another way of saying how not to take something personally. Exactly. And see, and we could even say preparation for dialogue, cultivate your humility. <laughs> I mean, oh, absolutely. Go back to this thing is like work on. It's understanding that that your position is your position. And, it, and when we go into dialogue, it, our job is not to convince the other person that they're right or wrong, is just mm -hmm. to have an experience with them to get to know what where they're coming from and to share where we're coming from without the idea of trying to change either person. Right? I mean, it's now that, that, that yeah. Our, oh, our, yeah, our Uber called that the eye to thou relationship, right? That was the essence of if I come together and just enjoy you as you are, and you can enjoy me as we are, and we're not trying to change, I'm not expecting anything from you, mm -hmm. I'm not demanding anything, I'm not wanting other than the experience we're having. Now, right. that. I like let me just say this real quick. I love, I love how, how this stuff, it's one of my fast, most fascinating things, how this stuff comes back to what we do in the therapy room, because what, you know, what, what I, what I call that with working with, with families is, is conversations to convey, not to convince. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we have conversations in, that we, most conversations just need to be conveyance of information, sharing information. And I love the idea of, of, yeah, just conveying information and not always trying to debate. Yeah. Well, that's the second thing is that the next chapter after preparing, preparing for dialogue is why listen mm -hmm. and then learning how to listen, right? Why listen mm -hmm. and learn how to listen, right? Mm -hmm. So are we listening to try to understand that person's experience? Or are we listening to collect information to prove them wrong? So there's right. different yes. types of listening, right? Absolutely. Am I, we're already formulating our response while they're talking. We're not really listening. That's not listening. Listen. How am I going to rebut this? Like we're debating rather than dialoguing. Right. And if, if we're really listening, we say, wow, you think, how does that connect? And you, you ask these questions. It's like you enter the, the, the listening with a sense of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Right. And open-mindedness. And open-mindedness and stuff. And then, and then the next chapter after that one is is now managing your emotions as you listen. <laughs> mm, that's, that's, the thing, maybe. that's a tough one. It's understanding fight, flight, and freeze and how to, to become aware of these things and de-escalate yourself and repair yourself during the conversation yeah. and how to de-escalate conflict. And then she goes on to, after that one, is cultivating understanding, looking at distorted perceptions, applying a corrective lens, perspective taking, learning about other people. Mm. what does this just tell me about that person mm -hmm. how to be righteous without being self-righteous Ooh, i need a lesson in that one mm. how to be yeah, righteous without yeah. being self-righteous mm -hmm. you know that's i think it's a great topic and right. then talking, mean, yeah. yeah and then she goes on talking skills do i finally get to speak telling your own story do i do I tell my story and, and reflect on myself or when I'm telling my story, I, I, I judge the other person. There's a difference between just talking in a way that's sharing versus talking in a way that's judging. Well, that's something we know from in, in the recovery world. You know, that's, you know, we, you know, not taking other people's inventory. We, we learn again, it's all there. We learn to, you know, share your experience, strength and hope. You don't, you don't, I don't tell you what to do. I tell you in, in my life, 
you know, when I've had a similar situation, this is one of the things I've experienced. Yeah. That's now we can do that and it can be sort of under the table judgment if we're not, if we're not being really careful with ourselves, but there, but, uh, but when, when we, when somebody really does that, when somebody just experience shares their experience as an offering, you know, take what's helpful, leave what's not. It's like, that feels wonderful. Yeah. Yes, it does. And, you know, so I'm just kind of building on what you were saying, Tom, is that there's yeah. some people are paying attention to this, right? So yeah. We've got to learn how to do this. I mean, the rest of the things she talks about, you know, talking skills, dialogue skills, dialogue skills in action, strengthening your dialogue skills, you know, all of this stuff becomes so important in us learning how to do this. So when you hear this list, it's a no mm-hmm. wonder we have trouble. What do we say, Tom, when there's trouble? Mm-hmm. Of course. Of course of you course do. Of course, there's mm-hmm. this trouble right now. Mm-hmm. Who spent time learning this stuff? Do they teach this in school? Right. Did you learn any of this stuff right. when you were going to school, guys? I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. stuff wasn't taught. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we see it happening in therapy offices, but we don't see it happening in terms of the general public. And look, yeah. A, a, a self-help book that sells 6 million copies is considered to be an amazing book. How many millions of people are out there in our, in our, in the United States, 360 million. Mm-hmm. So not even 10% of our population reads a mental health book that, that does incredible. It's like mm-hmm. 2%. Mm-hmm. So how are we going to establish this change when we got 2% of the people, right? You see the dilemma here we got yes. is how do we turn what we know to be helpful over to the general public? How can we help them see the value of this, the benefit of this stuff? What do we go back to AA and say an attraction, not promotion, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. How do we get people attracted to a different way of life? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a tall order, isn't it? Right. I like, but I, li- I like the fact that, 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 that the, uh, uh, is it the national psychological association that's put is, the American uh, psychological American. association okay. has published mm-hmm. this and Good. the title of the book is beyond your bubble. Mm-hmm. It's by, it. by Tanya Israel, mm-hmm. PhD, T-A-N-I-A, I-S-R-A-E-L, mm-hmm. PhD, beyond your bubble, how to connect across the political divide. But what I what I like is is that that you know because so often we've been we've been taught you know we got to stay we got to stay out of this we got to stay out of the conversation I've been you know when I've been when I've written political commentary through the years I've gotten uh, quite a lot of criticism about that stuff but you know one of the things in writing my you know my ebook on that's on my website it's called Therapy for Politics is that there is now an obvious place for, for mental health awareness and for a mental health component in politics. And, and I love the idea that the American Psychological Association is, is, uh, is, is seeing that too and, and putting that out there because, because we really, see, I just think, and I don't mean this as an arrogant thing. I mean, this, is just, this just happens to be what we do for a living. And we've worked on it hard personally and with other people. We, we have, we have, we have some skills that we could put to use here to help people improve their communication. And it's like, it's not, you know, I haven't figured it out, but I'm, but I'm determined to, to learn more about it. And so I'd love, I can't wait to read this book. Yeah. Yeah. Something in the direction of nonviolent communication that Marshall Rosenberg writes. Yes. About. I think about his stuff all the time. Absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of times it's don't, don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, read nonviolent communication and, and the people who've done training with that stuff. That is such an amazing uh, uh, collection of information and, uh, uh, and strategies and techniques. Yeah. So, Alan, when, when you were speaking, I was thinking of the uh, psychological concept of uh, selective attention. Yeah. That when we, we're very attached to our beliefs, we attend selectively mm-hmm. to our, things in our environment, beliefs, ideas, what talk show hosts are saying that already correspond to our pre-existing beliefs. So there's a selective perception. We're in this echo chamber, this bubble of hearing people who agree with us and reinforce our pre-existing beliefs. And then there's selective inattention where we select out those views that disagree with our views. Yeah. So we very, we stay very comfortably ensconced in our own 
bubble and our own limited view, view of things. Sometimes it's called confirmation bias. We, yes. we, we, we look to things that already agree with us and that kind of bolsters our ego, our sense of self, rather than tolerating ambiguity and uncertainty. Well, and, and that, that should, according to, you know, Alan, you said we need a, we need a, a, a test for humility. That should be on the test for humility because if, if, if any of us says we don't have that, if any of us says that we don't have that, we're we're either lying to each other or we're lying to ourselves. Yes, because we all do. And I don't mean it's all we have. I just mean we all have that. It's a natural inclination, natural tendency to uh, have a confirmation bias thing going. Yeah, on. I would much. Yeah, I would. It, it's well. First of all, it's easier. It's like it's you know uh, you know I, we I I, I stay I, I tend tend to move away from uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's very comfortable if I'm listening to somebody who, who you know, is going to make me feel like I'm right and feels, you know, yeah. and, it may, and it may be all fine and good, but it's like, we also have to make room for that discomfort. Yes. Yeah. So it also ties into the, the last part of that article that I was starting to read. Um, mm -hmm. uh, sadly, we often elect officials who remain committed to their fears and dissociate from the complexity and ambiguity that is part of life. Yes. As the philosopher Voltaire warned us, doubt is not a pleasant state of mind, but certainty is absurd. <laughs> doubt is not a pleasant state of mind, but absurdity is, but, but certainty is absurd. That's a good one. It's a good, that's a, and that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful uh, uh, John Amadeo uh, placement of those, of the, the of that quotation. It was, I love that. That was the, that, that's what I call the punchline of, of that, that excerpt. I love that. It's a perfect punchline for it because it just, it just brings it home. Yeah, it really does. So it's comforting too. I don't know, I don't know when he, when he said that, but it was a long time ago. When was Voltaire around? Does anybody remember? Oh, he, he's been dead a couple of years. <laughs> I think, I think, I think he, he, he and Frederick Douglass were roommates for a while. Oh, really? oh yeah. <laughs> Wasn't it Frederick Douglass that, that, that Trump didn't know was dead? Oh, he said, he said, he said, oh yeah. He's getting more credit all the time. You know? <laughs> but we cannot forget in the revolutionary war that they, that the, that the airports watching the forces <laughs> were able to capture several air and it was very important because the bombers that the british had back in the <laughs> 1700s were were destroying much of the of the of, the, of our army that's right <laughs> so voltaire was born in 1694 1694 in paris that's man that, that makes us feel young yeah, so it's comforting that these wise people existed for you know many years ago, and you know the truth just has a way to carry mm -hmm. forward wisdom. Well, it, it's, it's strangely it's comforting to know that people were just as messed up in other t times too, because I think sometimes we you know we have that thing of like, oh man, it's the worst it's ever been, and go like, nah, it's been this way. Yeah, you know, this is the human well, I, condition. Yeah, you know that's the other thing that I think we're facing here is that. This, this other idea is, is that somehow we think that if we elect official that they have to be perfect, that they're going to have all the answers. Yeah. I mean, even now, it's ridiculous when I, in, you know, I, I enjoy CNN and I'm a CNN follower, but they're already criticizing Joe Biden's choices and he should have done this, he should have done that. It's like that there's somehow we're going to find that official that's going to be a perfect and just going to do everything perfectly. So we're all going to be all right. And nobody takes the time to say, well, look, at this is the way he's approaching it. There's other ways to, to approach it as well. Let's see what happens here. Right. Okay. Let's see what, what goes on with this. But there's so many judgments already taking place. Which fuels this craziness that we have. Now, that's interesting, Alan. One of the things I've said actually for years, even before uh, uh, the, the Trump's presidency and Obama's presidency, I've said is when, when somebody's talking about a, a president, especially, nobody ever begins, the, begins by saying, well, of course, this is the hardest job in the world. You know, this is the most complicated thing I could possibly imagine. You know, nobody, nobody puts those those disclaimers on it. Nobody prefaces anything with the idea that we understand this is complex and there are, there are more moving parts and variables than we could possibly imagine. We speak about it. And, and John, you were talking about it in what you read. It's like we that's one of the big problems here. We speak about we simplify things that are complex 
you know, and, and that we make complex. This is what I believe when we make complex, the things that are simple. Mm, good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes too, is the perfect is the enemy of the good. That's right. That's, oh, that's so beautiful. We cling to perfection. Mm -hmm. You know, we want the perfect leader. Yes. So mm -hmm. we don't vote for Al Gore. We vote for, um, what's his name? Uh, Sure. Ralph Nader, Ralph Nader, he's yeah, the perfect yeah. candidate, right? Yeah. And so Al Gore gets knocked off and we get George mm -hmm. Bush for president. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Will you all be watching the inauguration next week? I will. Yeah. I'm, I try yes. not to assign too much symbolic value just to individual political moments, but I mean, it's, it's huge for me. I mean, I think I'm going to feel a kind of, uh, some kind of shift. I don't know what it yeah. is. I've come to value these kinds of rituals that we have. I think that there's some, there's an importance to them. And so, yes, I definitely can see that. I want to see that. And I want to see what, you know, that it's a historic moment. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And there's, and there's hope. We need to say that in all of, all of the other things we're saying here, there's, there's, you know, I mean, if there's, if one, one of the takeaways, if we're practicing what we're talking about here is there are, you know, we're not looking for the one or two, three simple, simple answers. These are, these are complicated things. And, and, uh, and you know, I hope, you know, I, I feel that, that we're, we are at this moment with this subject doing a decent job of, of, of demonstrating humility in the sense of, you know, I can get on my high horse easy enough, but it's like I also, and I think that's true for all the, the other three of you, is acknowledge, no, there's there's a whole lot of this I don't understand yet or, or don't, uh, don't know what to do or how to do it. And I, in, I really do, you talk about curiosity, Alan. I, it's like, I believe curiosity is, is so important in learning and, and we don't learn without it. And, and we need to keep asking questions. Yeah. And, spe and speaking of hope, Tom, I, I, if I may read the, just the last couple of sentences of this article. And by the way, okay. if anyone's interested, I have this. Uh, this is uh, my blog column on psychology today. If people want to look at this article or other articles, they can go to John Amadeo Psychology Today blogs and all these articles will come up. But this last sentence says, transformation often follows periods of darkness. I think that's often common. You know, the phoenix rises out of the ashes, right? Mm -hmm. a, herd a herd immunity against violence and dis discord can emerge as enough of us develop the courage to promote a politics of hope, cooperation, and kindness. May it be so. Read that again. Yeah, that's beautiful. Like that. That beautiful. Transformation often follows periods of darkness, a herd immunity against violence and discord can emerge as enough of us develop the courage to promote a politics of hope, cooperation, and kindness. May it be so. Wow. That makes that, I feel, I feel that in my chest, John. I, I, I feel breath. I can breathe when you, as you read that. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're so, you're so, I mean, I, I, you know, you, you, you're so smart, but it's like, you're, you're just, you're, you're wise. I, I just really respect that, that way of thinking of yours, because you have a way of putting that, those things in ways that are, um, I don't know. They're just, they, they go down, they go down nicely. I, 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 I love your writing. Well, thank you so much, Tom. That's very touching. I'll try to let that in. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Shut up and receive, right? That's yeah. it. I was just thinking that, that whole workshop you did. <laughs> yeah, we had the. I, I have the. I still have the bumper stickers here, the little stickers here that we that we came up with after your your speech on, on, on your talk on Thursday. Shut up and receive. Wow, that's your new bumper sticker. Great. People, people love these. I, you know, so many people need to hear them. So I keep yeah. them around. And of course, now I don't see clients. I don't see clients any right now. So I'm always just showing them on the thing, but. One day I'll be dealing them out. Beautiful. Yeah. The art of receiving is, the, you know, we need to practice the art of receiving. Yeah. I mean, that's also part of the problem here. We don't have time to go into, but if we can all receive more, feel loved, feel connected, we'd be less prone to be violent, more prone to have dialogue. And that's right. Yeah. 
and, and cultivate kindness toward each other and, and really listen to each other. Yes. Everybody Amen. wants to be heard deep down. That's the deepest longing. And we all want to be heard, want to be seen, want to be appreciated. And people that are tend to, toward rage and violence are people who aren't feeling heard and validated and valued. So that's, that's a big part of the, of the problem. That's right. Yeah. Is that the same thing as wanting to be understood? Yeah. Wanting to, it, seen, I, I, wanting to be understood. Yeah. It's all part of the same okay. process. Yeah. Yeah. Want to be valued. Want to feel like we have worth. Because we can, we can be valued, and maybe this is just, like you say, for another time, but because one of the things that I've worked with people on and, and certainly explored in my own life is, is the idea that ultimately, it, if we look at our desire to be understood, I don't know that one, any one individual is going to be, can be completely understood, you know? And so and I don't, I don't want, I don't, I wouldn't want my, understanding that I can be valued and loved and, and considered a, a, a part of everything to be dependent upon whether any, some, some individual understood me. Well, I think it maybe it's simpler to just see it as you know, wanting to be heard from moment to moment. If, we, if we're feeling something, we're feelings about something and we have a need or a want, yeah. And we can share okay. that. We feel sad or hurt or afraid or embarrassed. And, and someone really hears, oh, I really hear that you're sad about that. I really hear that you're angry about this. You really it, understand okay. that, you're, that you're afraid or that you're embarrassed. And, and it's really about that in. That people feel less alone. The experience in the moment, then, is what you're In the moment, about. yeah. 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 That's, that's, I love it. Okay. Okay. Global like, sense you know, it. It's an interesting, that helps. It's an interesting point you make because I, I just flashed on this and I don't know why I connected this way. But had Trump been able to accept the loss mm -hmm. and just be disappointed? Yeah, grieve. And he would have then, all of these people that are angry now about the outcome would have been able to deal with their feelings differently. Yeah, yeah. You know, if he could have just said, look, I was really hoping to have another term here. And, you know, you saw how hard I worked to try to go out there and get reelected despite coronavirus. And, you know, I am terribly disappointed and I've fantasized all these things that kept me out like uh, the vote was stolen from me. But the reality is, is I've lost mm -hmm. and that people have spoken. And there's many of you that supported me and I appreciate that. And I'm terribly disappointed. Now, yeah. all his followers would have been able to grieve. Yeah, the grief, right? Just experience the loss. It would have been, they're, now they're here feeling the loss, and it, they can only be mad about it because they're told that it that it was stolen from them. See, that's what I meant about content creates a context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that if if the content was that this was a disappointment, we would see a peaceful transition of power. You know, there would be the appropriate amount of, of grief and disappointment and some, you know, which is fine. I mean, it's it's important that people get to express that feeling. But you see, that goes back to that thing is if you don't, if you don't deal with your feelings, what happens? Mm. Yeah, you got to come out sideways, man. Yeah. They in really are. In destructive ways. That's right. They do. I mean, the more I own my stuff, the, 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 the more I own my shit, the less I go shitting on everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I say it, but it's yeah. so damn true. It's just, and, and we see that right now. I mean, it's so, so sad because what we're really talking about is that there does need to be a certain level of mental health, doesn't there? In a good, in a leader that we need in our country. Mm -hmm. um, and you brought this up before. I mean, probably one of the most powerful positions in the world. And there's no criteria other than that you're able to run for office and, and be I an know. American citizen. I mean, that's it. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're an American citizen. You can run for this office. You, you have to prove more when you get a driver's license mm -hmm. than run in this country. I mean, my God. Oh, yeah. I we got to test I, our vision. We got to test our hearing. Yeah. We got to be able to answer a few questions about. I mean, 
I, no, I, I, I was I worked for the civil service. I worked for I worked for the state of Tennessee. I had to pass some tests to to, to qualify for, oh, for, for getting in. Just 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 to be a social worker, to be a psychologist, to be a licensed mm-hmm. therapist. What do we have to go through? Yeah, yeah. Well, just to use a sports metaphor, you know, uh, in a basketball game, you know, what does it say about the game if uh, you know one team says that uh, any result other than my own team's win is going to be illegitimate, and then. <laughs> You hit the referee and you aren't thrown out of the game. You know, I mean, that, yeah. it's very. That's, uh, it. that's it. Perfect, Patrick. It dismantles the whole mechanism. So mm-hmm. that's part of what needs to occur uh, content mm-hmm. wise going mm-hmm. forward. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we get stuck in the early stages of grieving, denial. Remember the Kubler Ross stages? Mm-hmm. Grieving, mm-hmm. Denial, anger, bargaining. You know, bargaining. Mm-hmm. Like maybe the mm-hmm. court will overturn this if we present mm-hmm. our case. It'll. And and never get to acceptance. Yeah. Never get Nowhere to near. sadness. Yeah. Never get to sadness and loss. That's and, right. and and I appreciate that too, Patrick, because I, you, I I know you're what you're really doing is acknowledging my my process of grieving that the Titans are out of the playoffs and and so uh, yeah. Exactly. Well, this has been a really important conversation. Thank you, John, for starting us off with such a. Yeah. A thoughtful and 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 wise yeah and and people go go to and i and, and not only did you say it but uh, but uh, uh patrick can put that in the in the in the, the notes after in our thing to go to your your blog for psychology today and f- to your website to find your books it's like there are so many wonderful articles on, you know, on that psychology today blog it's it's like i just rec- i mean i recommend it. they're 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 my favorite kind of stuff with they're, they're, they're not very long. They're bite-sized. They're, they're, you know, you go, you get in, you get something out of those and you, and you take it with you. It's it just, they're, it's just wonderful. So that, and, and your, your, your books, you know, dancing with fire is, is to me, my, my favorite. And I think it's just amazing book. So I love that. I love that somebody sent you, the, I love it when people send you a quotation out of your book that you don't even remember writing. I know. That's, 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 <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys have this experience, but after I finish a book, I'm finished with it. Yeah, me too. Like, I don't even remember much about. The I book. don't even. I, I, I. Somebody pointed out that I don't even refer back to the content I don't when I, I'm when I'm teaching really. other people. And it's and it's, it's like, no. I I had a guy. I had a guy send me something. It's a little poem thing called what 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 is strength and and he he sent it to me in Facebook a while back and I and it was I thought this is I love this thing and I wrote to him and I said I didn't see an author's name who who wrote this and could I could I borrow it uh, and uh, he he wrote back and said you wrote it and you know and, and i looked back oh. at it again and went i still think it's beautiful it's wonderful <laughs> it's, it's so so uh uh it's, and what I, 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 I said that right yeah <laughs> well i mean as writers don't you don't you, don't you write stuff that's smarter than you think you are anyway <laughs> I mean, I've been doing that for years. It. I'm surprised I wrote it. Is what the yeah, I go. I, am. I go like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. Exactly. I hope people can to- have been able to tolerate us for this long. That's a long time to to be listening to us. So appreciate people's patience. All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap it right here. So, John, how can they mm-hmm. learn more about your work? Can you tell? Yeah, go to my website. It's Tom said John and you'll have access to my articles and my books that way. Yep. Tom, they still find out about you. Yep. Oh, they go to the FBI most wanted yeah, list. Go, go to the FBI most wanted are you list. Are you five or four <laughs> on that list this week? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm working my way to the about top. Trump. My God, I'm surprised that they haven't sent the agents to your house right. yet. I'm working my way to the top on that one, but it's, it's just go to tomrutledge.com and uh, I mean, all stuff about our, about our, our podcast here, uh, articles, books, lots of things are there. So go, yeah, go find out. And, uh, and we, and, and really want to emphasize, we, uh, we love hearing from you. So, so you have, you have my, you, you can do that through my website, through Alan's website. Uh, if you, if you know how to get a hold of Patrick, it's like, you know, it's like, let us hear from you. We love, we love hearing from people who are listening. All right. Sounds great. Patrick, any final words from you for today? You get the, you get to be our Lawrence O'Donnell on this one. The last, word. last word. Well, just thank you so much for joining us, John. And I'll be sure that um, I include the link to your uh, psychology today, uh, blog entry that we discussed and uh, you know, uh, everybody hang in there. Help is on the way. 